<laughs> Hello and welcome back to the Green and Moment Show here on Newcastle Fans TV. Today we are joined by the man who has been reporting on all North East football for the last eight years for Sky Sports. And of course, he's the man who broke the news that Newcastle were officially taken over nearly two months ago. And Newcastle are no longer in the hands of Mike Ashley, as of course, Keith Downey from Sky Sports. Keith, welcome to the Green and Moment Show. Thanks, guys. Nice to be here. Keith. I think two months ago when I spoke to you on Newcastle Fans TV, the takeover, it was just one of those crazy, crazy nights. And you, you, um, you described it very similarly to your time when you were covering Rangers in the away for cup under the late Walter Smith. Do you still feel like that way now? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wasn't comparing it um, with regards to to what the actual occasion was like, because it compl the occasions were completely different. I, I, what I kind of meant by that was, I hadn't actually ever worked on anything that had kind of been quite so emotionally charged as, as what that was. Um, when Rangers got to the UEFA Cup final back in 2008, um, they'd been through the season before that, some really poor decline under Paul Le Guin, and they were, they'd, they'd been playing some awful stuff, and Walter Smith and uh, Ali McCoyce came in and, and dragged them up and not just won them the title that next season, but got to the, the final of the UEFA Cup. I mean, they beat some huge teams along the way to get to get to the final. And I'd been there throughout the whole process. I'd, put, I'd gone to every single game home and away. I think it was maybe 21 or 22 games all the way through. Um, and it was just amazing. It was an amazing thing to be part of. And I have to say, um, the 7th of October 2021, when the takeover finally went through, was was kind of reminiscent of that because it just um, is one of these occasions where you realise what was actually happening meant more than actually the story itself and it meant so much more to so many people um, and I think that was kind of what I was alluding to on the night when, when we when we chatted it was just it kind of came out of the blue a little bit but then at the same time it hadn't because everyone had been talking about it for the last couple of years and more so it was um it was a it was a strange old day. It was, as I say, it was quite emotionally charged, and I suppose I knew what I was saying on camera and what I'd been kind of looking at on my phone for about an hour before I broke it. I kind of knew what it meant to so many other people, and I think that's probably why my emotions kind of sort of took over a little bit. And I think also because it it, it kind of played out through the day. We'd been live since eight o'clock in the morning. I think I'd been live a little bit the night before that as well, when we kind of knew it was it was going to happen. And uh, it kind of just built up and built up on the hour, right through the day, up until the the climax at um, about quarter past twenty past five in uh, in the evening. And even even then, you know, people were finishing work to go home. You know, kids had finished school. It was like it was. We had such a big viewing on Sky Sports News. I think people sort of waiting, waiting all day for some news. And it kind of just built up to that that real climax at that time. And I, I think that's kind of what I meant by it. it wasn't It wasn't something that just kind of happened under the radar. It was there was a a nice flow and a, a good chain of events that led to the actual announcement at that that time on the Thursday night. I mean, it was like four years in the making to to almost it seemed dead and buried or as Simon Jordan said, deader than a dead thing in whatever. To almost in 48 hours, jobs are good and, and it's all said and done. It was it was yeah. strange how it all panned out so fast. But, I mean, my phone was pinging away and I'm a no one in Staffordshire. So I imagine yours was going absolutely crazy. I mean, just when did you first catch wind of this now happening? It's now happening. Was it to do with the piracy? I'll let you into a little story that I've not said, and I actually was um, I was on the panel at the, the Newcastle United Supporters Trust talking last Thursday, um, and I was going to tell this story and I actually totally forgot to. Um, so this will be the first time I've said, but yes, you remember <laughs> you, you. It's not that exciting, don't worry. Um, but you re you remember the day before on the Wednesday, um, Martin Ziegler from the Times. Um, mm out a story to say that the issues with the piracy had been resolved with, with the state of Saudi Arabia. And it was on the, the Wednesday, the day before the takeover went through the 6th. I was actually on the golf course over in, in Whitburn, um, uh, just on the edge of Sunderland actually, playing, having a really nice day. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. I had the day off. Um, and I saw that story pop up. And around five weeks before that, I'd been made aware um, from people close to Mike Ashley 
that the takeover could be back on, but I was sworn to secrecy. And I have to say, given what had happened the year before and with, with everything for a long time regarding this takeover, I was quite happy to keep it quiet because the last thing I wanted to do was put something out and it was yet another false dawn. So I'd actually been given the date of the 26th of September as a date where something serious could happen regarding the takeover. That was all I was told. I wasn't told it was going to go through. I was going to, I was told that there could be some, some big movement regarding that. There was only very few people, I believe, that know this because not one person has ever repeated to me that they were told the same thing. The reason I was told that was because um, I was actually um, conducting an investigation behind the scenes as to why the takeover didn't happen. And the reason I was doing that was because we at Sky Sports had come under a little bit of criticism for not having reported, reported certain, certain elements of it. One of those was the, the march, the rally down in London in the summer. Um, and I took a little bit of stick because I'd been covering the open golf instead. And although we had a camera there getting that, I hadn't sort of reported much of it on my, my channels, but I'd just been caught up with the golf. And if I'm honest with you, I kind of looked at it and thought it didn't really seem as big a march or rally as what I thought it was. But anyway, took criticism for that. Um, my boss at Sky um, had kind of been included into a few tweets and emails, and I think he'd been contacted by a number of fans look, saying, look, why, why aren't Sky doing anything about this? So he thankfully tasked me with trying to... Um, find out why the takeover hadn't gone through. I mean, how, I mean, it's like the holy grail that, I mean, it was almost an impossible job. But what I did was I contacted Mike Ashley, I contacted the DCMS, I contacted the Premier League, I sent emails out to every single club in the Premier League asking what had been said in Premier League meetings, etc., etc., trying to get to the bottom of why this hadn't happened. And if I didn't get an answer, at least we would have had a programme that we could have put together. I think he wanted me to do like a, a little mini docu on it. So long story short, um, I was doing that and as part of it, I wanted to get an interview with Mike Ashley um, and I'd been told by someone close to Mike Ashley um, that he will do an interview with you, but just hang fire until the 26th of September because there could be movement regarding the takeover. So I was like, right, great. I sat on my hands till then. 26th of September came and went. The following week, I think it was the 3rd of October, following weekend, 3rd of October came and went. And I was at stage where I was like, right, I'm going to have to go back to them here and say, we've, we've, we've not got anything on this. And I was kind of almost days away from that, actually, when I was playing golf that day and the story from Martin Ziegler um, popped up on my phone and everyone was talking about it. And I kind of put two and two together and I thought, something's happening here. And I just had, I just had, a gut, I think w with years of reporting these things, you kind of get a gut feeling sometimes that something's happening. So I finished the round of golf, couldn't really concentrate in the last five or six holes because my phone was going non nonstop. And I had a, another couple of people in my ear hearing, telling me that they were hearing bits and pieces that sounded fairly solid. Got myself back to Newcastle. Um, got a call literally as I drove into my driveway to say, get yourself to Jesmond Dean House. Amanda Stavely and the consortium are there. And I was like, wow. And there'd been a few things in the morning. I think there'd been a couple of like tweets and people talking about a, a private plane flying in with uh, Amanda and her husband and uh, Jamie Rubin on it. Normally you don't believe these things, but it just all seemed to be adding up. So I got along there, met them. They said, look, we're hoping it's going to be announced by six o'clock tonight. Bearing in mind, this is only four, four thirty. I was like, well, wow, wow, this happened so quick. As it transpired, it went into the, the following day by the time they got the, the funds transferred. And there's lots of bits and pieces that need to be completed um, regarding the deal. But interestingly, this is a bit that I've not mentioned before. Um, I'd spent that whole 24 hours like trying to stand up Martin Ziegler's story in the Times about the um, about the piracy being being sorted out, and I couldn't fully stand up, even though I knew that the takeover could be back on from what I've been told. I didn't actually have the facts in front of me regarding that, that he had and how much that much that meant. <laughs> and then the next morning, I was doing lives at eight nine o'clock in the morning on the day the takeover went through. And I was just sitting in my car in like a little half hour between lives. And I looked at my phone and I don't know what made me do it. I went into my, my junk um, mailbox on my, on, my, on my emails. And I had a, an email from um, someone, I think it's okay to say this now, someone high up at, at B in sport, um, basically giving all the details of the, the agreement, the, the sorting out of the situation with uh, the Saudis. 
And I looked at it and it was high importance, red exclamation mark, sent to me. And I'd looked and he'd sent it to like three or four different people just given the information. And one of them was, I think it was Martin Ziegler. And it was word for word what he'd put in that story the day before. So what I'm saying is the actual story, I'd been sat there for 24 hours in my junk, junk email inbox. And I was, <laughs> and I was scurrying around in the background trying to stand up his information. And I'm like, where is he getting this from? And it'd been in my email inbox, my junk email the whole time. Um, I don't know why it went into my junk, but it's there, high importance, and it was almost word for word his story. So I could have probably had it stood up a lot earlier the day before, but then we've also got the issue with Sky. We've got a slightly different relationship with the Premier League to most others in the fact that we've got a commercial partnership with them as well. So we kind of have to work hand in hand with them in certain elements, which helped me with the takeover because the reason I was able to break slash announce it was because the Premier League gave me the statement an hour before it was done. So the bit on TV when I said the funds have transferred, I knew that the takeover was done, but I'd been asked to hold it for 45 minutes while they just tidied it up at the end. So I'd been sitting looking at it for the best part of an hour, knowing that it was done. I could hear the fans behind me cheering, getting excited, thinking it was... And I knew, and I, I didn't I didn't tell a soul, not even my cameraman, not even the presenter who was next to me, because I just knew I had to keep this quiet until we actually announced it. So yeah, so long story short, I was actually sat in the story when I was playing golf that day and like, stressed out when i got back here and i was like look how strong can we go in this and my bosses were saying well can you find out anything from being sports and whatever and i actually had it in my junk email inbox that whole time and i just missed it so so i need to get i need to sort out that email inbox and make sure things go through properly <laughs> to be honest with you though um keith that just sums this whole takeover up really doesn't it the fact that it's taken so long and then you actually have the information in a junk email and I think that's absolutely brilliant to be honest I think yeah. that's typical of Gaston United well. I mean I still I mean I still would have needed a bit more to have for me to have gone as, as strong as we did or as strong as others were like I, I probably couldn't have just I mean from that information came from someone I didn't know but then you you can tell like it looked like a, it looked like it was from a you know a senior a senior source and it was it was a very solid piece of information but I would have still wanted to stand up with my sources at the other end but obviously by that point I knew that the consortium were in Newcastle anyway so I knew that like you know it was it was going through but it would have just given me that extra element of um confidence and security regarding what we're talking about had I known about that that information there from being I mean it, it must be a surprise at the start when Mike Ashley's agreeing to do an interview with you. How many times have you attempted to get a word from from Mike down the years? Because he's not overly forthcoming with anyone. Yeah, I mean, I, well, I've, I I haven't actually interviewed him myself. Um, it's mm. been my predecessor, David Craig, who's done yeah. the sort of handful of interviews we've ever had with him. But I think this was it got to the stage of the takeover that it was reaching the point of no return, really. Hence why I was why I was doing that investigation. And I think probably he thought, yeah, do you know what? I'm not going to lose anything by and I think I think what he was probably going to do is in his interview, I think he was probably going to try and like I think he's probably going to come out all guns blazing, criticizing people. Um you guys still there, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just just showing the pictures in the background. That's I cool. just lost you a second. Um I think I think he was gonna I think he was gonna come out all guns blazing, um, if if he didn't get any kind of um sign that this was going to be passed through but obviously he didn't want to do that until he reached this point so wh however he did it or whatever they did to get to the stage where the Premier League decided to climb back down he's done it successfully so he was given it until the 26th of September and then obviously then gave it another two weeks but I think he was getting to that point where he was going to come out and he probably would have just you know gone for everyone but but he, he waited um, and obviously he got he got what he wanted and he, and he got the sale. Um, so yeah, I mean I've only ever met him once or twice briefly, but I've never actually sat down and interviewed him before. So I think that that kind of shows what stage the takeover got to and 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 how long it was protracted for. The fact that he was after me doing this job for eight years, willing to sit down and do an interview had had it not gone through. But obviously with the I, I'm not sure whether the um, the cat case week before maybe had part to play. I don't know. But for whatever reason, the Premier League decided that um, th that, that was it, and they they were they were happy for it to be pushed through. So he didn't need to come out all guns blazing, and, and you'll you'll be aware we've not even heard, we've not heard from him at all since he's just kind of disappeared into the background now. Would you like to do that interview now, though, in terms of speaking to him and just looking back at his time in football and his time at Newcastle United, and what sort of questions would you ask him? Yeah, I mean, listen, it'd be in it would be interesting, but I, I just. I just think it's, 
think we need to move on a little bit. I mean, listen, mm. if, if, there, if there was an appetite for that, I would happily do that. I would be interested to know exactly how it got to the stage, why the, why the Premier League passed it through, whether he would say, tell us that kind of thing on the record or not, I'm not too sure. Um, I think at this moment in time, the bigger situation is um, dealing with what's in front of us, trying to get you know, Newcastle in a, in a place where they can try and stay in the Premier League and, and I suppose try and find out more of the plans regarding the, the, the consortium. I just think... You know, it is an interesting story, the Mike Ashley thing, but I feel a little bit as yes, it's kind of yesterday's news, and I, f I feel the fans and those onlookers need to concentrate now on on putting all their efforts and resources into getting Newcastle back to where they belong. So, with that, then, how nice was it to finally draw a line under it and announce that takeover? Because I don't know if you're aware, actually, Keith, but I was in a uh, when the news was announced on Sky Sports News, I was in a Downy Grave sandwich. Um, after, <laughs> after, after you announced the news, Mike Wedderburn come to me via Skype on my works car park for reaction, and then it went to Did Pete. he? Did mm. he really? Yeah. So I'm glad Pete came after me because he was getting emotional. I didn't know you were getting emotional, and if I'd have yeah, seen the one, I'd have started blubbing, no doubt about it. Yeah, but I, I think Pete put it on, you know. I've said this to him. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't, he didn't want to be left out, and he's like, I can't have this guy for Scotland crying if I'm not crying, so I think that's why he started. Um, I didn't know you were on, because do you know what? I've been so busy over this last six, seven weeks, I've not even I've not even watched anything back. I've literally not, like, I've recorded that whole day. I don't know. I don't normally record um, me doing stuff on TV, because you're doing it so often, like, you just kind of, you just get a little bit sort of blasé about the situation. Um but that day, I knew it was going to be a big day. And I just, mm. before I left at seven o'clock in the morning, I just recorded the whole day because I thought I want to have a look back at that and see like how it played out. Um, so I've not, but you know what? I've not watched it. That shows how busy I've been that I've not even watched. So I didn't, so I didn't, I didn't know you were on. I've had a lot of people sending me little bits and pieces and clips. And I've seen the bit where, where I got upset and stuff because a couple of people sent me it. Um, but no, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know you were in that Downey Graves sandwich. Um, <laughs> oh, it, was, it was a wonderful, it was wonderful to be the filling. You wouldn't, yeah, you wouldn't have been the first, you wouldn't have been the first individual in that sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, it was a great day though. And I was, I was gutted. I was so jealous watching Johnny do all the interviews with yourself and fans around the ground, because obviously we knew it was on that day on the Thursday, wasn't it? We knew it was going to be announced, and I'm like in Staffordshire, desperately trying to get my shift at work covered so I can just hop in the car and come up. And I didn't get yeah. to do that, but um, fortunately, I was there for the, the Spurs game. What did you make of that carnival atmosphere that first game back? You know, it was unbelievable. The pre-match, it was really, really. The, we popped out for maybe, I think I popped out for about half an hour just to try and get a sort of flavour of of the support outside speak to some fans and I, i've never been in a situation like that where fans were actually like queuing up to try and speak to us and they wanted to just give a little bit i mean and, I, and i'm talking fans from all different backgrounds not just like the usual ones you see hanging around the training ground of the stadium like yeah you know, the, the two there's these two old women who really stuck out to me they were in their maybe mid to late 60s they've been following newcastle for over 50 years they've got season tickets and they were like i was watching you all day and all this kind of thing and just some of the stuff they were saying like it was i mean even saying it now it kind of is making the hairs in the back of my neck stand up it was just they were having the, those this most they had these matching Newcastle United cagoules, like waterproof cagoules on, and they were just like, they were just like lovely people who were just pure football fans, like living in the moment. There was another guy who'd flown over, I think the piece has gone quite viral actually, and Twitter, another guy who'd um, flown over from, oh, I can't remember, somewhere in America, I can't remember now, but he'd, he'd flown over um, and it'd taken him days to get there. And he managed to secure a ticket and his dad had been from Newcastle and it, it, his dad would have been a hundred and something years old. He was doing it for his dad and he got a bit upset as he was talking to me. And they were like, I noticed there were so many young fans as well. Like so many dads were like their little son or their little daughter or their kids there coming over. Can we just get a photograph with this guy? What's mate? Can we just get on and just do a little? And they were queuing up to speak to us. And it was a carnival atmosphere is the best way of putting it. It was, it was an unbelievable and, as much as the takeover going through was amazing on the, the Thursday, 
that 10 days later, that kind of couple of hours, two, three hours, I mean, even three hours before the match, St. James's Park was outside, was like a hive of activity. It just had a real good feel-good factor to it. Um, and I think if you could bottle something from the whole takeover and take it away, that kind of, um, that that day, that pre, pre-kickoff against Spurs was was arguably the, the best part of it all, and it was it was amazing to be there and, and be part of it. And I think I think I think I at that moment then realised how how kind of um, sort of synonymous I'd become, or how big a part I'd sort of played in it, given the amount of people who were trying to talk to me. I mean, you would normally get people talking to you anyway, but it seemed like on a, a, a much bigger level, it was almost it was quite a bit overwhelming actually, like the amount of people who would just want to come over and they kept saying thank you. They kept just saying thank you so much, thank you, thank you. And I'm like, you know I didn't buy the club, yeah. You know I just like <laughs> the first um and I was like, what are you saying? Why why do you keep saying thank you? They're like, oh just thank you for like your coverage and thank you for sticking with us and we've been we've given you a lot of stick and abuse over the years. And obviously there has been a lot of that and you know thanks for being so respect respectful towards us and giving us the coverage on on the day and stuff like that and it's really nice because you don't often get thanked for your job these days so it, it was really nice to have that 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 kind of feedback i'm well aware though that they're only saying thanks because i'm telling them what they wanted to hear had they been telling them what they didn't want to hear the word would not have been thanks <laughs> i think that's happened over the years keep i think many of you see new tweet notification from keep down i think you get a, a shiver in your spine if you don't know what's going to happen <laughs> Talking about the new owners now, Amanda Stavely, is it just safe to say, Sir Keith, she's a breath of fresh air? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, she's she's a, she's a really nice person. I think that's the best way of, of putting it. And I think I got a little bit of criticism um, on Twitter from a few national um, print journalists when I tweeted, probably a little bit naively, saying, you know, the new owners are just nice people. They're trying to do it right. What I meant by that is I meant the people I'm dealing with on the ground here in Newcastle and Amanda Stavely won them. They're just, they're just nice people who want to do the best for Newcastle, and she wants to play a prominent role in the the rebuild of this football club. And she wants, honestly, she wants to do it for the people of Newcastle. And you see her stopping and speaking to fans in the street. It doesn't matter who they are, what age they are, where they're from. Um, she'll she'll give them her time. I think she's quickly realised how big a task this is. I don't think she probably realised quite how big it would be, and I think that's probably why things are happening fairly slowly. Um, there's not many of them working on the process. It is going to take time, and she, to be fair to her, she stressed that from from the word go. Um, but certainly in the in the interview I've had with her, and a couple of meetings I've I've had with her since, um, she's been very polite, very courteous, very respectful for the club, and I think interested to find out stuff as well because she knows she doesn't know it all. So she's quite happy to or quite keen to tap into. Um, the thoughts of, of of those who probably do know the club in the area a little bit better. So, um, yeah, I think that's the, the, the best way to, to describe her. She's a nice person. She wants the best. She's learning as she goes along. There will be there will be mistakes made. She said that herself, and some have been made. Without doubt, the, the Steve Bruce situation probably was a bit of a mistake in, in how long it took. And then, obviously, the Unai Emery um, managerial search that was that was a mistake so there's been a couple of mistakes already and they're only just in the door but listen they'll learn from these and she's owned up to them already so what would you rather someone who was trying to do the right thing and and making mistakes or what what you had what you had previously um at least she's listening to the fans and i think as she's going along she's realizing they're making mistakes and you know the, the club will be a better a better place from the fact that they're going to learn from them Oh, absolutely. I mean, I know we're all in the the Newcastle United bubble, but we were all buzzing that she came out, did an interview, open communication. St. James's Park was being cleaned. That was that was trending on Twitter all day. But I mean, what do you make of like the scepticism from some national journos? I remember one on Takeover Day. I mean, I won't name names, but like that was just slagging off Pete because he got cans delivered to the Sky office. Was like, yeah. What's not and it's you know. I mean, I think I think we need to be a little bit careful. I mean, if you want to be seen as a kind of respect, I mean, I know Pete's a fan, um, but I think we need to be seen as respected journalists as well. So um, that is why, I mean, if I'm honest with you, whenever I've been asked that, even at that talk in the other night, or I've been asked, oh, did you have the, have you got did you have the cans open, or have you done that? And I'm like, no, do you know what I didn't like the, the night the takeover went through? Um, uh, when I finally finished up about eleven o'clock, 
Um, God, I'm just looking at that picture in me there. I look like I look like I've been I look like I've been up till eleven a.m. the next day. Um, <laughs> I, uh, we went into town and I had a couple of pints in town. I had a couple of just littered a couple of beers with a team that I was working with, and it was more just kind of like I wanted to get a feel for what the city felt like and just sort of what the atmosphere was like. And also, I wanted to kind of like um, I, w I wanted to just sit down and have a couple of pints with the team that I'd worked with that day. We had a presenter up from Birmingham. We had another reporter up from Leeds. I had a couple of people working behind the scenes and with three or four cameramen. I just wanted to go and just sit and say, Do you know what? That was a day's work because compared to anything I'd ever done before, that was just off the scale. So yeah, but I think I think it's important that we are still seen as national broadcasters and we are respectful to the whole situation. And it's a bigger situation that what I don't like is people attacking the Newcastle United fans for um celebrating just essentially getting their club back. You know, you you can't choose who's taking over you. I'm sure if you had the choice, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the, the Saudi back regime. I'm sure it would be like the local businessman made good that's worth like seven hundred billion pounds instead. Of, I'm sure you'd rather that. But you can't choose that. You just wanted Mike Ashley out of the club. You've been wanting it for a long time. It was getting to the stage where it looked like it was never going to happen. So I almost get the impression you would have you would have taken anything for, for, for him to go. Now I'm not saying I'm not saying this consortium is as anything. It just so happens to be the richest consortium that's ever taken over a football club. So it's been a double win for you. It's a shame that people are sort of not allowing you, not not allowing you, but criticising you for celebrating that. But I think it's something you're going to have to get used to. And I think it's something you're just going to have to be bigger and better than and just kind of rise above it and just think, I'm supporting my club here. And anything else that comes alongside that and any criticism is, is over my head here. And I think you just need to concentrate on... On, on your part of it and that's basically that is basically following your team home and away going to St James's Park at the weekend and, and enjoying it so it's, it's it's a really it's a really sort of political um awkward situation and that's why it's hard for me I even felt a bit guilty because I got a bit like emotional when it when it when it went through and it wasn't because it wasn't anything to do with who was taking over Newcastle it was because I knew how much the fans wanted to be taken over, and you were finally being taken over, and I could feel I could feel what it meant to you. Um, it just makes everything a little bit more delicate. It makes the situation a bit more delicate when you're reporting it, and it's just something that the likes of myself and Pete and others have to be have to be aware of. Um, but it's not going to go away. So again, it's something we need to learn from, and we need to make sure that we report things responsibly moving forward. I think that's going to be very interesting to see what happens because there's going to be some bigger, bigger stories now in regards to Newcastle. Look, we could still get Newcastle could still get relegated this season. That's how crazy this this year could be for Newcastle. But do you think Newcastle fans in general keep have the, know the understanding that Newcastle now are the wealthiest club in the world? Do you not? Do you think it hasn't hit them yet, or do you not think it will hit them until maybe January at the earliest? Until you might see a couple of names that. Who yeah, probably never been linked with the club potentially. I mean, I, I don't think it's hit me yet, if I'm honest with you. So I doubt, I, I'd say it's probably the same for you guys as fans. I mean, you know, this Newcastle, this kind of small little outpost, really, in, in European football. I mean, the size, I mean, when I moved here in 2013, I just always thought Newcastle was huge because we'd come down here for nights out and it was always rammed in the city centre. You had a football club that got over 50,000 in every home match. And I just thought it was this massive metropolis of a city. I grew up in Edinburgh. And then when I moved down here, it something made me. I said, like, what, "What is?" I kept walking around the city centre for ten minutes and thinking, "How am I back here again? I'm back in the same spot." I was like, "How small is this city centre?" And I looked at the population. It's half the population of Edinburgh, where I'm from, and half the population of Glasgow, where I lived after. And I was like, "Wow, I didn't think that." Like it's just this kind of small little place. But I think it says everything about the city and the and the people here that there's a population of what two hundred seventy thousand. And one fifth of those are at the match on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon or wherever it is, which just shows how much everyone's invested um, into the cause. Regarding the money aspect, I think um, I, I don't think it's hit in. I, I probably probably hasn't. And you're like you say, like it's it's like I think it's going to take until some big money is spent until people realise, hang on, we're back at the top table again. It's going to be really really interesting to see what is going to happen in January because. I mean, it's it's already looking like a really, really difficult job to, to stay in the Premier League. And, and I don't even mean what Newcastle do. I'm more concerned about what the other clubs do because all those clubs at the bottom have got wins in them. Look at look at them. Norwich winning last week. Watford beating Man United 4-1. Villa first win under Steven Gerrard 2-0. Leeds 
like they're all capable of winning games and that's what worries me more more than anything so it's going to be interesting to see in january and i don't have any the only information i have on this is that um they're going to do things um they're going to do things properly and correctly and gradually that's what they keep saying and it's a process now that will have been altered i think by recent results and the fact that you're now right at the bottom you're now rock bottom of the, the league will they decide to chuck money at it but our players then our big name players are going to want to come to a club Yes, they'll get good wages, but are they going to want a club come to a club who could be in the championship next season? It's a really hard, and I think you'll miss out on a lot of targets as a result of that. I think Prem, English Premier League clubs probably won't want to do business um, with you so much. Um, I think you are probably going to have to look abroad for for, for signings. Um, but it's who wants to come to a club that look as though at this stage you're going to get relegated. It would take a, it's, it, it's, I mean, it's going to take a massive job to keep you up this season. I think a lot of fans just think, oh, it's all right, we'll buy, we'll buy four or five players, we'll spend like 80 million or whatever and in January we'll be fine. It's not as easy as that. It's getting the players, it's the hard, and it's the hard point. And these players need to be available and the January transfer window is hard enough to work in at the best of times, never mind when you're at the bottom of the Premier League. So um, I think it's I think it's going to, to answer your question. I think it's going to take a couple of big name signings for the fans to realise that you are now the richest club in the world. I, 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 you're right. I don't think that's properly hit home yet. No, it hasn't. I mean, I'm still thinking Hamza Chowdhury on loan, but you know, I'm sure we'll <laughs> even eventually. Even yeah, exactly. I'm sh could maybe even afford him on a permanent. Who knows? But um, <laughs> just how much damage was done, Keith? Um, last summer then with no real investment of just the the willick signing and the frankly rubbish start we had under steve bruce and how did uh, your relationship with steve bruce kind of change from when he first started in the job i mean i got i always got on well with bruce um like i think i was one of a few journalists that he would that he would answer the phone to and give even the night the takeover I went to i phoned him um just to have a chat with him and he gave me like a few words on the phone that i think i then reflected on screen and i've always gotten quite well with him um you probably even heard like his press conferences and stuff like he would um he'd, he'd quite often call me by my name and stuff like that and you know he wasn't like that with everyone so i should i actually had a decent relationship with him um that all that that all ended on the week of his sacking because i think he was unhappy about the sort of blanket coverage regarding him set to go but you've got to remember as i'm stood there every hour reporting saying steve bruce is about to go steve bruce is getting sacked he'll be gone by wednesday he'll be gone by thursday he'll be gone this week that's all information that has been given to me like given to the rest of the journalists i'm not i'm not standing there i'm not standing there reporting something that i'm just guessing or or that's information we are getting so i think that i think the consortium probably needed to have acted a little bit faster because that was obviously the news that were coming out from the top that, that he was he was going to go but i think it was just a bit more difficult getting him out of his contractual situation i don't think when they came in they realized he had the contract that he had and it was almost eight million pounds to get him out of that contract which is unbelievable obscene amount of money to get a manager out who was failing who was failing and they've had to pay him to get them out but that's the contract that mike ashley had put together in the event of a takeover he would get that kind of payoff so it was a bit like a bit of a favor ashley had done for bruce if the takeover had happened i don't think that well i know he wouldn't have had to pay so much to sack him himself but then the contract that he had meant that he wasn't one of the better paid managers in the Premier League, but he had this huge buyout should the takeover go through. So he's kind of he's kind of done his mate a little bit of a favour there. Um, I can kind of see why he's done it. It's it's some businessmen would look at it, business people would look at it and say it's genius what, what, what he's done because he's kind of kept him interested and he's kept him hanging on. But it shows that he probably wasn't going to get sacked unless unless it was the, the last resort. Um so, so it was that was why the situation was getting dragged out. Now I can see why Steve was upset because we were stood there every single hour outside the training ground, um, basically saying he was going to lose his job. He's two hundred yards behind me inside the training ground. It's all in the big screens, the TVs right around. The players are sitting in the canteen having their breakfast, standing around the TV listening to what they're saying. He's he's in his office just behind the wall. It's a really really awkward situation I can imagine, and I'm making it worse by reporting on it every hour. So. I felt bad about that because he's a, he's, a, he's a good guy and I like him and as I say, I've had a good relationship with him. Um, but on that Friday, so I'd been stood there since Monday talking about it. It got to Friday, not for a second that I think it would have taken. It gone all the way through to Friday. Like we were being told he wasn't going to be in charge for the Spurs game. And he came into the big hall to walk through to go to the press conference. And I know that like I'm just about to interview him in his press conference and I see him coming down 
I had a one-to-one -one penciled in with him after the press conference ahead of the live game. And we also had a one-to-one -one with one of the players, I think it was himself. And he's coming down, I thought, I'm just gonna go and I'm just gonna go and speak to him and just uh and just apologize. And I I, I just said, look, Steve, I'm I'm uh, I'm really sorry for the amount that we've been outside all week. Like I, I do think it's been over the top, but you know, it's international week. And he told me to to, to do one essentially. Um obviously I'm not gonna repeat what he said. Um and I understood, and I understood, and I actually understood why he was like that, and I was expecting it. And I said, look, Steve, let me explain. I said, look, it's International Week, there's no other stories. And obviously he wasn't happy. He said, well, that's no consolation to me. I've got family, et cetera, et cetera. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm kind of downplaying a little bit how he said it. I'm trying to make it a little bit um, broadcastable. Um, and then, you know, I, I said, look, I just want to apologise because I didn't want to be out there that much, but there's obviously a hunger for information, and we thought it would have been done before now. But he wasn't having it, so he then went into the press conference, and um, and you probably heard the press comments afterwards when he was saying like, the media deserve a slap and all that kind of thing. And I understood his frustrations. I think he was embarrassed. I think he was mortified by the fact that it was all getting played out in public and it had taken the entire week. So I understood it and look, look I accepted it. Um, but weirdly, when the press conference started, given what he'd said to me in the, in the indoor hall beforehand, people keep coming up to me and going, "God, he went for you in the press conference." I'm like. You'll wait to hear what he said to me before it started, but I'm not going to say it here. I'm not going to say it here because we're live, but you get the gist. I think I've said it somewhere else actually, so you get the gist of what he said. Listen, he was it was keep the moment stuff. He was mortified by the situation, and you know, I think, I, I think, I think he was just upset, and obviously that's ended our relationship. I'll I'm going to try and maybe give him a call and and sort of have a chat to him about it once once the dust settled. And I noticed he was out on holiday, so. I will do that, but I've just been so busy. I've had I've had the chance to be honest. Um, but yeah, that, that that but that's what happens. I mean, listen, managers come and go, and you, you deal with them for a certain amount of time, whether it's six months, two years, five years, and then sometimes you don't speak to them again for another few years until they pop up managing another club that you cover, or you go to a press conference and when you oh, I haven't seen you for a few years, and that's what happens. It's all part of the job. But listen, I'm sure he's going to be okay with his eight million pound in the bank, yeah, and he'll walk into the Man United job, obviously. Yeah, well, he did say to me, he said, Steve, look, I know you've got your mortgages to pay and you've got your bills to pay, but this is, and I said, Steve, you know what? Yeah, I do. I do, actually. We do have that to pay. We need to do what? You don't want your £8 million in your back pocket. So um, <laughs> I, think, I think they do, I think they do, I think they do realise, like, you know, we've got a job to do. And I think, I think Steve, I think he's, I personally think he's had some unfair criticism. I liked him as a guy. Um, I thought some of the criticism and some of the things I saw were way over the top. I mean, I saw people at the training ground, groups of kids and stuff, running after his car. Who, the same people who had moments earlier been asking for his autograph and a, photo, and a photo, running after his car, up the lane and screaming obscenities as he's trying to do a right-hand turn out of the training ground. Like, honestly, horrible, horrible. My camera and I turn around looking at each other going, has that just happened? And, you know, I, I've seen, I've seen like, ca cabbages being sent to the training ground and, like, you know, this is this is a guy, and okay, he wasn't doing the job that you guys wanted, but he was still he was still trying to do the job, and it was his dream job. And sadly for him, it turned in, into a bit of a, a a bit of a nightmare. But um, I'll 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 defend the fact that I think he's. I know a lot of people think he's not, but and I know he kicked off at me in that last day. But I understand where that came from. I really do, and I probably would have been the exact same if I if I was him. And I actually I had probably more respect for him the fact that he was like that with me rather than just like yeah it's okay it's okay like at least at least he was honest with his feelings yeah for sure we don't condone any of that sort of stuff at the training grounds um and i saw like it a number of like number of times actually yeah it's awful um steve bruce has left and eddie howe has come in i think after watching the game on saturday sort keith of. against brentford pardon sort of he's sort of here <laughs> <laughs> um, after watching the game on Saturday against Brentford Keith is it going to be one of the best jobs he's ever done getting Newcastle out of this relegation so we can keep the Newcastle up because especially yeah. at especially at defence we look uh, well Newcastle look an absolute shambles at the back well listen he did a great job at Bournemouth took them from from nowhere up to the Premier League and I think that'll still go down and go down as his greatest achievement but I think he's soon realising quickly realising just how huge a job this is as well um, you know, especially the fact that you didn't get a result on Saturday, having played so well, like played so well, created so many chances, had the most shots and goal this season. Joe Linton looked like a different player, so did Shelby. Um, St. Maximin to me looked looked like he had an extra spring in his step. Um, 
to have not got the win from that it will be the galling situation for him because these are the games you need to win. I mean, I said at the fans thing last week, you need to get bare, bare minimum, I thought, seven points out of that next four games. Um, so now there's three to go. Um, and I think, so you need, to, you need to win the home games against Burnley and Norwich. That's six. And now I would say, may not get a point against Arsenal. That's bare minimum of those four games to, to be in touch. And again, I'll go back to it. The problem is the other teams are all picking up points. Like the other the other teams at the bottom have shown they've got a win in them. And Newcastle, yeah, here we are sat here at the end of November, don't have a win in them. And the longer that goes on without one, the, the more difficult it gets. And you, you worry a little bit that the pressure of everything in the background and the takeover and the expectation now from the fans, because that expectation wasn't there before. It wasn't there. You were you were just kind of accepting that, that you were shit, right? But that expectation that expectation is there now. And you just worry, you just worry that that's kind of hanging over the, the, the players in the club a little bit. And the longer it goes on without a win, the harder it's going to get. But yeah, I think it would be a, a massive job. If Eddie was to get them out of that this season, it would be close on miraculous, I think, if if he was to keep keep you up, given given the start to the season you've had, the state that the defence is in, the amount of goals you're conceding. And really, the the situation that he, that he's inherited it, inherited at the club. So I hope that if the club do go down, it's not kind of held against against him. Yeah, it, it's it, it's a tricky one. I mean, if you're listening to the audio of this podcast, then you would uh, have already known that we lost against Arsenal on Saturday. But um, <laughs> yeah, that just goes to show how massive them next two home games are. But reinforcements will be made in in january and i suppose keith you've got to get used to extra workload now in in the transfer windows no no more on the golf course in the summer so much and all right there's a miggy almer on here and there but very very rare did we do anything you had a quiet month i mean that's yeah. all set to change surely yeah i'm um i'm kind of battening down the hatches for january um even if even if you don't do that much there's just going to be so many players linked Oh, and I'd yeah. imagine we stood outside. I mean, there's probably already like over a hundred players have been linked with the club. I mean, if you wrote down every player that's been that's been linked since takeover went through, and you've got to remember, ninety five percent of this is coming from agents who are trying to punt their players and get their players' names linked to Newcastle. None of this is coming from Newcastle themselves. I said that last week as well at the supporters trust, and I think a lot of the fans are surprised about that. That's not coming from the club. That's all agent driven. Um, but there's going to be loads of links. They're going to try to get players in, and I imagine January for me is going to be crazy. So I'm a bit like I'm a bit I'm kind of like hoping that sort of December is a little bit more chilled. But I think I think given your position at the bottom of the table and the the size of the games coming up, it's probably not going to be. And I've still got to do things elsewhere as well, as you know. I was at, I was at Middlesbrough last night. Yeah. Um, um, once we are finished here, I'm going down to Leeds to do an interview with a player down there. And I've got to come back and do a David Moyes press conference and zoom ahead of their, their Europa League game on Thursday. I've just had a message there saying, can you do Bielsa tomorrow? So I'm trying to do all that. And it's really hard to concentrate on on everything else that's going on when you're kind of getting dragged in all these different ways. So I'm hoping that the end of November, December is going to be quiet. But if there's nothing happening in Newcastle, I'll just get put onto other stories. So it's probably not going to be quite, it's probably just going to be busy in, an, in another way. Yeah. Um, listen, after the last year or so that we've had, I'm, I'm, I'm not complaining. I'd rather it was, I would rather it was busy than I, was, than I was twiddling my thumbs. In terms of how busy the new ownership's going to be, we'll, we'll find out in January, but how much is a sporting director going to be involved and how close are Newcastle are a point how close are Newcastle to a point in the sporting director keep from what you know? Honestly, honestly don't know the answer to this. I've been asked this a few times. Um Michael Emanalo, as we mentioned a lot, I've had people coming up to me in the street and in town and stuff non-stop and asking about him. I have to say I don't have that information that, that, that a couple of people have reported. Um I don't like to knock anyone's stories down. But I have to say that isn't what I'm hearing. So um, our name was put to me at the weekend, which I checked out the consortium and I was told that um, this individual had be con been considered, but it wasn't to be the one. Um, Emanalo, um, that that hasn't been, that isn't information I've been told. So that's why I've not reported it. I would never come on and do a story saying that he's not, he's not got it or he's not getting it. And listen, that might still happen. Maybe I just don't know that information yet. Um, it sounds as though that information's maybe perhaps coming out from his side of things, from Emanalo's side, which doesn't mean it's, which doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, but it's not, it's not information that I've got. So, um, 
I don't know when they're going to do it. I just knew their priority was to get a manager in. I've asked the consultant a number of times, look, are you going to get a sporting director first? They said, no, no, we're going to get um, we're going to get a manager in first. That, that's our plan. That's, what, that's how we want to do it. They've done that. So whether they bring one in now before the end of the season or um, before January, it'll be interesting to see. I asked Eddie how actually in my one-to-one -one within the day arrived. I said, look, who's going to do the work in the January transfer window? Is that purely down to you or will you have? I don't even think he knew yet when he came in. But he wants to work with a sporting director. He said he worked with a technical director at Bournemouth. He want he wants to work work with one. Um, so it'll be interesting. I think I think it's going to have to be a team effort. And to be fair, I think that Eddie and his backroom team get on very well with the new owners, with Amanda Stigley and the people doing the sort of leg room leg work in the background. So that stands them in good stead. At least they're all sort of pulling in in the one, in the one direction. It'll be really interesting to see how how it went. Uh, the thing I find funny about all of this is. Before the takeover happened, if I'm out and about, people just came up to me. It was the same question. What's happened to takeover? What's happened to takeover? What's happened to takeover? Non-stop. Takeover happened. And it was like, when's Brucey going? When's Steve Bruce going? When's Steve? Like, non-stop question. And then Steve Bruce went, is it, who's the new manager going to be? Who's the new manager going to be? Then it was like, is it going to be Eddie Howe? Is it going to be Eddie Howe? Is it going to be Eddie Howe? And now I've just noticed in the last week, whenever I was, I was out in town for a couple of years, who's going to be the sporting director? Who's going to, and it's just nonstop people asking that. So that's the question of the moment. That's what people want to be, uh, want to know. And sadly, it's not what you want to hear, but I'm, I don't have an answer to that at the moment. I really don't. Um, I don't know who and I don't know when. As I say, I know a couple of people who have been considered, but the club have decided against. So, um, in fact, I know of at least four or five who have got in touch with me, people I know who I think a number of them would actually be really good at the job. And I've gone to the club and said, look, these people will be interested in it. So whether they then look at that, I don't know. But that's that's how ridiculous a situation is. Everyone wants that job, but it's like the golden ticket. Who are the club going to decide? And I, I don't know who the, the answer to that question is yet. There's been a few named linked before these strong Emanalo rumours came in. I remember when the takeover first happened, it was Jason Wilcox. <coughs> who was a bit left field. I know he's at City, but then I just think back to like, well, if Wilcox is coming, Shearer back as an ambassadorial role. I mean, what's Stuart Ripley doing these days? <laughs> then, you've, then you've got a real, like, that, that, that. there's a trio that know how to win a Premier League. But yeah. I'm... I'm guessing like the next question after the sporting director is who we're going to sign in January, who we're going to sign in January. And the, and the yeah, big, one, the, that, yeah, the big one that came up was James Tarkovsky. I mean, would he go from one relegation battle to another, do you think? Well, I think he's probably done what he needs to do at Burnley, hasn't he? He probably wants a new challenge. Um, he's the sort of profile for what Newcastle will be looking for in terms of our British-based player. I said to you earlier, I think they'll look abroad. So I think Kieran Trippier comes into that equation because he is abroad and he's British, so he ticks those two boxes. Man United have been linked with him as well. He's more likely to go to Man United than Newcastle, isn't he? Um, but I think Tarkovsky is some someone who would improve the club. I think, I think they need... I think... They know they can't they can't run before they can walk. They need players who are going to come in and fit into the squad right. They need to improve the defence. And I think he would be ideal. Yes, he's he's getting on a bit, but he's still he's still a quality player. Um, he'll probably look at what he's done at Burnley and think he's done everything there. He'd obviously get better wages at Newcastle. It's more of a project. I think he would be a realistic target. But remember when Leicester tried to sign him before, I think they were quoted 50 million. So, you know, these guys aren't going to come cheap and other Premier League clubs are going to look at Newcastle know that they've got buckets of money and they're gonna they're gonna play hardball with them. It's not it's not gonna be easy to get these guys. I honestly think I don't think the January window will be as easy as many people think. And I, I think you need to be prepared to be disappointed a few times. I don't think you're just gonna pluck anyone you want. I think a combination with of teams not wanting to do business, the January transfer window being difficult anyway and the availability of players, I think it, I, I think it's going to be, and obviously Newcastle's precarious position at the bottom of the table, I think it's going to be harder than you anticipate. And I think you need to be prepared for for a, for a, for a difficult month. I don't, I, I think, I think, I personally think that the time when we'll see the, the sort of, the, the real signings coming in, the, the, the real moves being made, I think it's going to be next summer. I think January is going to be hard, I really do. So as you can see from a YouTube point of view, Keith, is in a different location. Well, he's in several different locations, as you can see, because he's got a, he's got a very busy day ahead of him. But Keith, the question we were going to ask you was: out of all your time reporting on Newcastle, apart from the takeover, what's been your highlight so far? Yeah, sorry about that, guys. I'm getting a little bit of stick these days from cameramen for my <laughs> timekeeping. So I, I knew that if I spoke to you for much longer, there. Uh, 
it was going to, that was going to increase. So yeah, I'm on my way to Leeds right now to interview one of the players. Um, so the highlight, yeah. So we were kind of discussing that earlier. Um, it's all probably been surrounding player arrivals, transfers. That's the kind of thing that's got me into this job. Like I really was obsessed as a child with players um, transferring to other clubs and the reporting that surrounded that. I just found it. Um, I found it really. I don't know. It just encapsulated. Just really kind of enticed me and got me into wanting to do this. And I got so excited at my club signing players. And I think you guys are like that as fans of Newcastle as well. You know, you get really. You get really excited when you're linked with a player or a fees agreed or whatever. So I have to say, probably and quite sadly, the the, mo the best parts up until now in the eight years I've worked in this job covering Newcastle have been player arrivals. Like there's never, there hasn't been any obviously trophy wins, cup finals, anything like that. I mean, if you ask me about the Sunderland aspect, probably the highlight for me has been down there at Wembley. I know, I know it wasn't. I know it wasn't like a major trophy in terms of the FA Cup, and it was the, the it was, was the very EFL funny. Trophy, I think. It was very yeah, funny. But like, but I have to say, I have to say, it was an amazing occasion being there, like, and seeing like forty thousand Sunderland fans at Wembley, and you know, being in Trafalgar Square the night before, and like, see, and I know, I know, the trophy was was essentially meaningless, but it was just seeing these guys all enjoy it, and that that's what we're all in football for, is for these occasions and 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 these things, and. I know you guys will laugh about it, but you know if that's you a few years down the line in the FA Cup or the the League Cup, I'll probably feel just the, the same because it felt like a big moment for them, and it was just a, a it was a carnival atmosphere. So sadly, Newcastle have not been close to that in the eight years I've been here. So it's all been it's all been players player transfers, and although that's that's good as well, it's obviously not. It's not of the same standing as winning a trophy. That's why we're all in this business. That's why managers take over clubs because they want to win silverware. That's why players play football because they want to get trophies. So the Miguel Almiron arrival late that night from um, from um, America and the morning after a win, a St James's Park win against Man City seemed like a, a quite a special occasion. You were smashing your transfer record that had stood for so many years and everyone was kind of a little bit obsessed with. Um, and then, and we obviously got shots of him arriving on the, coming in on the helipad. Um, and then, uh, or maybe, do you know what, he might not have been helipad, he might even have been uh, private jet, I can't remember. And then there was Callum Wilson that arrived last year and we were there and we got exclusive shots of him arriving and that was through our own contacts. And that seemed big at the time as well, £20 million on in an England international striker. So those were probably two of the highlights, I have to say. Um, which is sad, and in, in eight years of covering the club, it's just like a couple of transfers. But that's but that's what we've had to cling on to, and I suppose you guys have as well um, over the past while. And for me, it's a lot more um, interesting and, and fun covering you guys when things are good. Same with Sunderland, same with Middlesbrough. You know, when Middles got promoted that year, it was a lot of fun. It was fun being around the club since the takeover happened at Newcastle. It's so fun meeting people out and about. And I have to say, by the way. Since the takeover went through, I've not bought. I don't think I've bought a drink in Newcastle. I do not. <laughs> Rightly so. Rightly honestly, so. I've not not bought a drink. People just keep coming up and offering to buy me pints all over the place. So that's been nice. But yeah, those those moments when you guys are happy, it's what kind of makes the job for me. And that's why the takeover was such a special moment. Um, that's why you know, hopefully moving forward, there's going to be good times ahead, and I'm and I'm excited excited to cover it. It's just a shame we've got the threat of relegation, the cloud of relegation, sort of looming over our heads at the moment. Um, which would just be the most typical Newcastle thing ever to get taken over um, in the richest, uh, to become the richest club in, in the world, and then six months later be relegated at the Premier League. I mean, you, you literally could not get anything more Newcastle than that if you tried. Um, so yeah, so th those have those have kind of been the highlights, the transfers so far. The other one I've not mentioned, and it seems so long ago, was the Gini Wijnaldum arrival. We we got a mm -hmm. tip off, and that we managed to keep it quiet all the way to him arriving at the airport. Like that just doesn't happen these days due to social media. That was back in I think that was back in 2014, maybe. Like we managed to get that, keep that quiet with his people all the way through to him arriving at Newcastle Airport, and we got there. And we got the shots of him walking through, and I think it was Newcastle's first signing, and maybe well, three or four transfer windows or something like that at the time. So it was, a, it was quite a big deal, and obviously he's gone on to to great things with Liverpool and and now PSG. So um, 
yeah, th- th- those have probably been the highlights. And, you know, it's qu- it's quite sad that they have. Not that they weren't big moments, but you'd like to think they'd have been bigger things than a, than a player arrival. But that's just the little scraps that we've had to hang on to over the last how many years. And, and, I'm, I'm just, and obviously it's the same for you guys as fans as well. Yeah, go on, Sam. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we got relegated that season as well, didn't we, when we signed Gene and Wijnaldum? So that bode brilliantly. It you with <laughs> yeah, that. sorry about that, yeah. Keith, it's been an absolute pleasure talking all things Newcastle United. And again, I'm sure loads of people have been saying thank you for your coverage and being so respectful. So I'll say exactly the same thing. Thank you very much for being so respectful for your coverage on that day because it, it will probably turn out to be one of the biggest days in Newcastle United's history. And... Who knows what will happen? So thank you very much for all your work in regards to the team. Yeah, no problem. No worries. I, th- I, th- I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was um, it was a really big moment, and it's it's moments like that that you kind of do this job for. And I think that was I think that was probably, as I say, why I got a little bit emotional because um, I realised kind of what I, what I was saying and the words that were coming out of my mouth and the statement that I'd been looking at. I'd read it over four or five times. Before I, before I announced that, I realised what I was saying kind of meant so much more to so many other people. Um, and it's it's kind of been the, the sort of, it's been the the variety of people who've kind of come up to me and wanted to speak about it. It's not just been like the usual, like sort of, you know, guys our age, they go to the match, it's been like families and like older guys in their 60s and 70s. And as I say, those two old women before the game. And I think that's what's made it more special for me is how is how much this has meant to like, a city and a, and a, and a region um, and I think that's why I kind of got sort of a little bit upset on the night because I realised the magnitude of it and I could kind of hear it down at the Bobby Robson statue, you know, 20 seconds after me me reporting, me, me reading it and, and delaying it, it was kind of making the hairs in the back of my neck stand up and it's moments like that that get you into the job. So no, listen, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm only doing my job, but as I say, I'm well aware that people are thankful and happy now just because I'm saying what they want to hear. It's not been like that for, it's not been like that for a long time. So lo- long may this continue um, and let's just hope you kind of try and stay up this season. But you know what? If you don't stay up, you don't stay up. The club, what would you rather? The club in the championship trying to do good things under new ownership or the club in the Premier League just trying to stay in the Premier League under Mike Ashley. And I think that's I think that's whenever it comes down to the you know, the, the concern over the whole situation, that is that's what you need that's what you need to consider and then and then and then to your sort of your happiness and your feeling from there. hundred percent. Sam has been brilliant now, hasn't it? Certainly has, and uh, if you want to subscribe to the uh, audio podcast, the link's in the description, and if you're listening on iTunes, please hit a five-star review. Fantastic stuff. A big thanks again to Keith Downey, and a big thanks to Sam Mulder, as always. This is the Greenwood and Mulder Show with Keith Downey, and we'll see you all very, very soon.